Hi. Can you still hear me all right? Yeah. All right. If it's too loud or too quiet, let me know. Um, I'm used to the microphones where you basically have to bite them to be able to hear you. Uh, hi, my name is Morgan, or online I'm Synaptic Rewrite. I'm going to be doing a 20-minute resin talk. However, given that this is one of those topics that I have a lot of interest and could fill in way more than exists, I'm using the slides mostly just as a crutch to make sure that I don't forget something basic and go off in the deep end on something more nitpicky. Um, so I'm going to run through this real quick and going to do a live demo. I have pieces that can be passed around for folks to look at or can come up to. Better? OK. Dun, 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 dun. Um, so 20 minutes is not a lot, and my sense of time was never the best to begin with. So let's begin. Oh, going back. Introduction. There's a delay. What is resin? Uh, various types of polymer soup is an easy way to put it. Different resins are made of different kinds of chemicals and components. Uh, usually you have to activate them somehow. This is known as curing. That's when you go from a liquid to a solid. So you'll start off with things in in liquid bottles here, if I were to open this up and do this, it would send resin everywhere. Don't recommend. Um, uh, <laughs> and harden into a solid object. Um, some resins will cure via heat. Some uh, will cure via UV light or just um, most of them, like most epoxy resins, which when people say resin casting, a lot of times this is what they're talking about. Uh, you'll have two components and it'll be mixed them together. One of them is a catalyst or a hardener and that'll actually create a chemical reaction that hardens it and thus you end up with it. Um, so there's many types of resins. Today we're just going to be talking about UV resin and epoxy resin. They're the two most common ones used uh, in the home, so to speak, uh, by DIY and all that kind of thing. Good for different things. We'll get into that more in a little bit. When I say casting, um, you're pouring something that will harden. Casting is... you. I say that for resin. Resin can also be used to coat something. Uh, if you've heard of conformal coatings, that's sort of a resin thing, but you're not casting it necessarily. Um, you can also cast other things. For example, many of the molds that are often used in resin, in resin casting, most of the time you'll pour it into a mold, and then once it hardens, it will create an object that is in the shape of that mold. So in order to make molds, you cast silicone instead of uh, epoxy. You can cast it out of other things as well. This is just a dice mold. Um, but you've, you may have also heard of casting uh, metal, uh, making candles in special shapes or even regularly shaped candles. That's also a form of casting. So not going not gonna to go too terribly much more on that one. Ah, right. I meant to take this off for the presentation part. Um, so yeah. Solidifies results in an object in the shape of a mold. Um, why is it useful? Uh, you can preserve or protect embedded objects, so sometimes it's used in electronics, um, particularly if you happen to have heard um, Ken, and, uh, Ken and Alex's talk about, say, dye bonding and all of that, and they mentioned like, the epoxy coating and whatnot. That's an example of, I would say that's more of a coating than a casting, but same kind of idea. You're putting a solid, you're create, taking a liquid, putting it around something to protect it and make it solidified. Um, this is not just limited to electronics, however. A couple of the examples I have are actually um, a bee that I found around my household because occasionally I find bees in my yard or whatnot. Um, it is possible to protect, um, to embed objects into resin and protect them. So if you had, like, say, a biological specimen that you wanted to protect, you could potentially do that. But there are things that have to be considered with that. Um, you can also put liquids into them, so protection, it's still solid. <laughs> Thank you. So if you like, so I'm sure a lot of people here are into like D&D &D and like looking at dice and that kind of thing. You may have heard of say liquid core. That's a little bit of a trick because what they're actually doing is they're either making a resin sphere, hollow sphere or taking a hollow glass sphere putting liquid into that, sealing that, and then that's what they're embedding because you can't embed a liquid just raw. It will, it will mess with the cure of the resin. Um, you can also make new objects, so like a lot of the things here. This is a giant D20 that I made with epoxy resin, um, and it started as two bottles of liquid, much similar to what's in this box here. 
I'm probably skipping ahead to my additional slides, so I'll just move forward a little bit. Uh, safety considerations. Uh, so yeah, I should probably go into that before I continue on this particular one. So first thing is ventilation. Um, resin does tend to put off fumes. Some are better than others. The more industrial-ish it is, the more that tends to be a thing. However, there are resins that are marketed as VOC-free. That's volatile organic compound. Um, the idea is that they've, for a lot of the ones that are used for like artist stuff or jewelry and that whatnot, they have somehow formulated the, changed the formulation so that it doesn't put off as much of this and it's supposed to be okay. It's still generally recommended that you use a respirator um, or have really good airflow, like uh, doing it outside or in a garage with like a fan blowing and stuff like that. Um, however, it's not just the resin you have to worry about. For certain additives, So we'll talk more about additives in a little bit, but for certain additives, they're actually powders. And since some of them are silicone based, or sorry, silica based like mica, this is a whole box of different colored mica powders, you don't want to be inhaling this um, or inhaling glitter. I mean, not that anyone should want sparkly lungs to begin with. Um, some of the dyes and whatnot, like alcohol inks, are probably one of the most, most common dyes. So you don't want to be inhaling that. Rubbing alcohol is also a really good way to try and clean up a still liquid resin mess. If it's already hardened, you basically just got to chip it or sand it or something along those lines. Gloves are also recommended. Um, I tend to use... I tend to use basic nitrile gloves like you would see at the doctor's office or a mechanic might wear them, stuff like that. Um, a lot of the kits will come with gloves. but apparently not this particular kit. Um, I do have an example, another example of the glove kits that will come with them somewhere. I don't recommend using those. I recommend getting some actual real nitrile gloves. Here's an example. Because these tend to be like super, super thin plastic that will be, super, will be incredibly baggy. Things are gonna slip when you're trying to grab them or move them around. They'll stick to things more. It's like, yes, it will do in a pinch if you don't have anything better. Uh, if you've ever dyed your hair, you're also probably familiar with this type of glove. But it's like the fit is not great. So why do you want gloves? Well, I mentioned one is the sticky mess. It's going to be a mess. Um, you can wash your hands afterwards, but even if you scrub it really well, a lot of times it'll st your hand will still feel, st still feel sticky. That's the other thing about these gloves. They are very noisy. Um, but you can see the fit difference between the two. If I'm trying to grip something, other than the fact that this is all smooth and slick, which also affects your grip, this is very much so. So like if I grab this, if I grab this, you can see my fingers sliding around. Um, if, resin, if resin gets on your skin, some people are sensitive to it to begin with. Um, some people are sensitive uh, to it to begin with, some people are not. Um, however, even if you are one of those people who is not sensitive with it to begin with, you can develop a skin allergy or skin sensitivity to it over time if you don't wear gloves, if you don't uh, protect your skin. Basically, if you like bathe your hands in resin on a regular basis. And it's one of those cumulative things, kind of like uh, the fume from soldering. You solder once and don't use ventilation or whatever and you inhale the smoke, you're probably not going to get cancer or whatever from that. But if you do it like say every day or every week or something like that for 10, 20, 30 years, you're probably gonna, you're much, much more likely to run into problems. Same kind of thing with resins. Um, goggles, I mean, do I really have to explain that one? Do you really want random chemicals in your eyes? <laughs> um, optional is an apron to protect clothes, silicone mats or aluminum foil to protect work surfaces. Um, all right, so, how am I doing on time? I'm doing fine. So, uh, tools and equipment. Safety equipment, we just talked about that. Goggles, gloves. Um, if you want to use splash goggles, you can, but it's not, you don't have to. It's basically just protecting from incidental splashing. Resin tends to be fairly thick. Um, oh, my goggles are around here somewhere. Ah, oh, they're there. Under the gloves, fittingly enough. So these are the goggles that I tend to use just because it's convenient. Um, so obviously you need resin. 
Um, and we will be again talking more about the differences between epoxy and UV in a moment. I'm probably only going to demo the UV because the epoxy takes a lot longer to cure. We'll talk about that more in a minute. Uh, the mold that you're going to be casting into, so like this. And molds can come in all shapes and sizes. It's basically, there are various limitations, but I have small molds, I have large molds. I did not bring my largest molds. You can also create molds, um, which is its whole own talk on its own. Um, uh, stirring sticks, silicones, plastic cups, all that kind of stuff. So you'll notice that I say the UV lamp here is optional. Uh, in this case, I have this little UV curing chamber, uh, which I've actually given a little bit of extra reinforcement to cover it, um, to cover the view port. UV resin, so you can cure it with a nice big curing lamp like this. You can cure it with a smaller one, like a flashlight style. You may have seen that before. Uh, UV nail dryers will sometimes work. However, if you don't have any of those, if all you have is a bottle of UV resin and whatever you're do using as a mold, you can still cure it by taking it outside and letting sun do it. Biggest UV lamp in the world, totally free. Might take a little bit longer, um, per, especially if it's like a cloudy day like, or something like that, but it will work. Um, mold release is optional, but I do recommend it. Unfortunately, what I, what I thought was my bottle of mold release turned out to be a bottle of Mod Podge, which will not help me with uh, mold release. <laughs> so I left that back in my room because it's not what I needed. Um, additives will have its own slide in a moment. That's colorants, mica powder, all that kind of stuff. Pressure and vacuum chamber. Um, so it's more useful for epoxy resin than it is for UV resin. Um, and when you're doing resin, if you, when you mix it up, it will create bubbles. When you pour it in, sometimes there will still be bubbles, sometimes there won't. Particularly like in the corners of molds a lot of times. So like, um, I don't know if I brought any examples where the corner of a die is hollow because if the liquid's not in there, then obviously nothing is going to become a there's going to be a hollow there and solid object at the end. In a pressure chamber, uh, what you'll do is you'll mix it all together, you'll stick it in at the very end, and it will, and then um, you hook it up to an air compressor. So this is like a, con a converted, spray paint, uh, converted paint spraying can is a really common one. Um, and it will crank, and you hook it up to your air compressor, you crank it on, or you turn it on, and it cranks up the atmospheres in there until it shrinks the air bubbles to the point to where they either are much, much less or completely dissolve into the resin itself. Um, so I, in a bit, I can show you examples of something that I didn't, that I did use a pressure chamber on versus something I didn't. And you can see how one is much clearer, doesn't have hardly any bubbles. The other one has little hollows and bubbles everywhere of various sizes. Um, a vacuum chamber can sort of be used the other way. I, I've tended to use it more in silicone casting than resin because the idea being that you put your liquid, and oh, sorry, yeah, backing up. With the pressure chamber, after you put it in, you leave it like that until it is hardened and cured. That's part of why it's not so useful for the UV resin, because if you do UV resin in it, the UV resin is just going to be liquid when you end it unless you've stuck a UV light with it. But it cures so fast that pressurizing it's also not going to do a ton. Um, the vacuum chamber, the idea is supposed to be you put in your liquid and you pump the, you pump all the air out and it pulls the bubble, the bubbles will expand, rise the surface, pop and go out. Um, so that's not as useful in resin because it's just not as effective. I've found the pressure chamber to be much more effective. Lighter or torch, that's useful for going over the surface of the uh, liquid resin, it pops the bubbles so that you help get that better finish. Uh, paper towels, rubbing alcohol, it, it's for cleanup. And apologies for the lack of photos. I intending this to be a very come up and look at it or pass things around. On that note. So, so this is a tray of mostly, I think that's mo the stuff go that's going to be going around now is mostly um, uh, epoxy resin examples. UV resin will visually look mostly the same. Um, so additives and colorants, not an all-inclusive list. Uh, I tend to break them down into liquids or powders. So. don't know what happened to the other box I had of them. So you can get sets of uh, liquid, uh, liquid pigments and whatnot. Alcohol ink is by far the most common one. A lot of times you'll see things that say 
pigment or resin pigment. Sometimes they're alcohol inks, sometimes they're other dyes or a dye and a, a paint and all that is basically just pigment plus some liquid base. So resin uh, ink will be similar type of things. Uh, use them sparingly. Usually all you need is like a drop or two for a fairly good amount of resin. If you add too many additives to your resin, it won't harden. You need it to be below, a, you, uh, and this is true for both powders and liquids, you need your additives to be below a certain amount or your resin will not cure fully and it'll be gummy and come out. If you really add too much dye, that dye will still be liquid, some of it will still be liquid when you get out and you'll pull it out and you'll get dye all over your hands. Ask me how I know. <laughs> So powders are also a lot of fun. I showed you the bottle of mica powder a moment ago. Um, you can, or, much like the alcohol dyes, you can order sets of them and it'll come with a whole bunch of them. Usually they're pretty cheap. Um, note if you order them, some places you order from, you'll just end up with a little pouch of uh, colored powder. And while those work, they're kind of annoying to keep around your workshop. They slide around, they open up, they slip out of your fingers. Um, Ordering the little bottles like this, I highly recommend. I actually ordered a separate set for this just because I knew I'd, I would be traveling and dealing with a million tiny little Ziploc envelopes was going to be a headache. Um, uh, so colored mica powder is, the one, is what you see most often used for giving sparkle or glitter or swirl type look to a lot of resins. Like if you've ever seen Chessex dice, if you do D&D &D stuff, you know how a lot of them will have like the sort of pearlescent shimmery color swirls in them? Usually that's a mica powder. You can also get other kinds of powders that are a lot of fun to play with, however, like color shifting powders where they look like one color in certain light or at a certain angle. They look like a different color at a different angle or light. Glow-in-the-dark powders are fun uh, for obvious reasons. Thermochromic, I just got some of those. Um, I have them with me, but I've not had a chance to play with them. But it's essentially uh, heated up and it turns a different color type thing. So think like mood ring, but in anything you want to cast in resin. Um, so uh, embedding objects. I talked about this a little bit earlier. So some of the limitations on embedding, you can embed all kinds of things, but there are some limitations. First off, it needs to be something dry. I mentioned you can't embed a liquid. Well, you're also not going to be able to do something like embed, say, a block of jello um, for a couple different reasons on that one. <laughs> but uh, it needs to be dry or somehow sealable because um, you may or may not have heard of or seen things where it's like, oh, they've embedded this leaf or they've embedded a piece of paper with a message on it or something like that in a block of resin. That has to be prepared ahead of time. First off, it has to be dried um, because any liquid will not escape. And if there's liquid, it will likely partially decompose whatever it is. So like the bee, for example. I left that for like a month or two before I embedded it. That was probably overkill. But I wanted to be sure that it was completely dry before I did it. The other thing is that you're going to want to seal it somehow if it's something that can absorb liquid. Um, because ex uh, paper is a great example on this. If you try to... Put, res uh, put paper into resin, there's a decent chance that your paper's gonna end up looking wet instead of looking like a dried, sealed thing. So you'll do something like spray Mod Podge, which is why I had that bottle, um, or an acrylic sealing spray um, like Krylon or something like that, or whatever else you want. Wax is sometimes a good option if it's something that can handle wax without looking wet. Otherwise, when you try to embed it and seal it, it's just gonna look like a wet clump, it's, or it's going to look like it was wet. Um, Whatever you're embedding also needs to be able to withstand the heat of curing because resin is an exothermic process. Um, with UV, with the UV resin, um, we'll talk about that more in a moment. The UV resin, the heat will come from the lamp. It will react to the light. It's photoreactive. With the uh, epoxy resins, it's a chemical reaction from the two parts mixing and starting that chemical reaction, and it can put off a lot of heat. Um, the exact amount of heat will vary depending on A, how much of it is... Oh, how much of it there is. Please just work this time. <laughs> uh, how much of it there is, how warm it is. Uh, some epoxies will not do well if you try to do it in, like, say, a garage in the middle of winter. You might need to heat it up uh, in order to get that reaction to go. It needs enough energy to get overcome the... There's a specific chemistry term that's not coming off the top of my head. Um, activation energy? Yes, that was it. Thank you. I had the graph in my brain, but not the uh, name. So it won't necessarily stop decomposition. Um, so you can seal something to try and protect it, but 
embalming bodies comes to mind for some reason, but uh, probably because of that B that I was just showing. It might be in the, I might have passed it along with the thing, I'm not sure. Um, on that note, more samples to look at. Um, so the question was if the adding too much of that uh, interfere if that is specific to like the dyes and the powders and whatnot it does seem to happen more often with the dyes than with the powders I've noticed however there is still a limitation I would suspect my suspicion is that it would probably depend more on the type of resin you're using if you're using like a JB weld much more industrial type resin uh, material I'm guessing that that would be much more tolerant of having other things mixed into it um, it's also possible that uh, some things may also interfere with the cure of certain of certain uh, resins or materials. Um, I'm familiar with it more from silicone because, like, there's certain there's certain materials that you're not supposed to embed because it will prevent the resin from curing or from the silicone from curing. Um, so it varies. Um, so won't necessarily stop decomposition. I talked about that a little bit already with the bee. If the bee hadn't been dried, if, the, if I had encased the bee when it wasn't dry. I would have just been encasing something that had water in it and it would have continued to decompose um, because the inside of it was still wet and bacteria would still be there and all of that stuff. If you're able to sanitize it well enough, maybe that would negate it, but I don't know. Um, consideration for if you're embedding electronics, and I have an example I'm going to show here. Okay, so this is not a good example of casting <laughs> um, because it was a pain in the butt and I was in a hurry. Um, and it's probably one of the largest things I've ever cast. So this is an induction coil. It's for lighting. Uh, it came with these little LED uh, coils that have a matching induction and it will light up if you put them on it. Um, so one of the things that you have to consider with electronics is heat dissipation. Um, you'll notice in this case that the induction module that came with this had this little heat sink. I actually made sure to try and tape over it to try and keep the heat fins mostly open. Some resins will conduct heat better than others, but generally for anything you're going to be, any basic one that you're going to be using at home or that you can get from like Hobby Lobby or Michaels or whatever, um, it's not going to be a great heat dissipator. So if you have something like this, make sure that you try and leave it open. This had mixed results. Yes. I've heard of conductive resins, but this one is not. Um, the basic ones, the normal epoxy resin that you get off of Amazon or from a craft store, something like that, that's marketed as uh, just two part, like artist's epoxy or whatever, generally no. Um, UV resin, no. Uh, you could probably add things to make them conductive, but no. Um, I will try to plug that in a little bit later. I think I might be starting to run low on time. Yeah. All right, so we're going to sort of rush through the rest of this. Accessing power ports and plugs, I had to tape off this. If you're dealing with a microcontroller that you're trying to embed uh, and you need know it's going to need UVX, or sorry, USB access, make sure that you somehow block off the USB port so that it can access it. Same thing with network ports. Uh, if you need any kind of test points, yes, you could try to drill through it afterwards. You can drill through resin, you can sand it, blah, blah, blah. I don't recommend it. I recommend just trying to get it set up to begin with. Um, powering it. Please don't embed batteries. That's a great way to create a bomb if it starts to decompose and uh, degrade. Um, also, it your electronic is less sort of serviceable that way because batteries are often one of the first things to die. Um, so you can embed a key charger, that's totally fine. You can embed um, a cable if you really need to or some wires, things like that. Those are all fine. Don't embed a lipo. <laughs> Casting procedure, I'm not going to actually do this one, I'm just going to talk through it real quick. Um, UV is going to be fairly similar. Prepare the area, gather your materials, lay down mats, blah, blah, suit up. 
I usually have an ap a work apron that I use at home that's covered in all kinds of strange materials. I forgot to bring it with me. Um, pour epoxy and hardener into, into one mixing cup, so you'll need part A and part B. Uh, most epoxies, at least the ones that I've been dealing with, have been one-to-one -one ratio, which means you pour in equal amounts. Some of them will be uh, one-to-two ratio or something like that. Um, mix them up. Go, uh, if you go it, mix the two together because it'll look, it'll look cloudy. You'll know it's ready once you've mixed together and you see the sort of differential swirls and whatnot and it's gone t through to clear. Then you're good. Keep in mind you have a limited working time because epoxy will cure on its own after it's been mixed together. It's a chemical reaction. Um, the, and the warmer it is, the faster that curing process. Um, slowly in the same direction, constant rate to reduce bubbles. Uh, at that point, you have your epoxy. You can mix in the colorant directly, or you can pour a little bit out in so another cup and mix in some colorant if you're doing multiple colors. Um, pour it into your mold in a thi high, thin stream that also helps reduce bubbles. Uh, use a toothpick or a torch to remove bubbles as well. Can you tell bubbles is an issue with casting? Um, optional if you have access to a pressure pot, use that. Then, you know, wait until it's cured. Usually I found with a resin it will be sort of tacky or sticky after like, you know, an hour or after a couple hours or something. Um, usually after like six to eight hours, usually it'll be solid enough I can pull it out of the mold if I'm really, really impatient. Um, but ideally you want to be patient enough to wait until it's fully cured. For most resins I've dealt with, it, that's been about 24 hours. Some of them cure faster, some of them cure slower. Um, also check how deep your resin is recommended for casting because some of them, uh, you only, some of them is only a little bit, uh, oh, sorry. I'm missing a slide. All right, there was supposed to be a slide that I had on, uh, UV versus epoxy resin. Um, so UV resin is going to be very similar. I'm actually going to try and set things up while I talk through it. However, I'm, however, I will also have to move the cart when I do so because uh, I will need power. So, UV resin is a little different from epoxy resin because you only have the one liquid. With an epoxy resin, you're mixing the hardener and the resin. So the, cat, the hardener is also sometimes called the catalyst. If I use that term, they're the same thing. Um, in this case, we are going to cast a fish. So here is a mold of a koi fish. So uh, one thing to note about some of the, one of the differences between if you're using UV or epoxy resin, because epoxy resin is an internal chemical reaction and it doesn't need light, you can use an opaque mold. So sometimes you'll see silicone molds that you can't see through. They're like blue, sometimes black, whatever, but it's like you can't, they're not translucent. That doesn't, that will not work for a UV resin because for UV resin, your light has to be able to touch all of the resin in order for it to activate. Um, so this is one of the other limitations. All these large dice that I ha that I was talking about. Thank you. Um, all those large dice I did with epoxy resin because if I were to do that with UV resin, I would have had to layer it for probably days. Um, that's a slight exaggeration, but with meal breaks and sleeping, might not be. Um, because UV resin, you can only do generally smallish layers. Um, you can sometimes get around this if with something like, say, this dice mold, because this is clear on both sides, so I can cure one side, flip it, cure the other side. It's tricky and that doesn't always work the best, but it does sometimes work. This can be passed around. Um, so, in this case, pick a color. What color do we want our fish? Red. Red fish. All right, so, a lot of resin kits uh, will come with these terrible, terrible little super thin mixing cups, especially if you order it off of Amazon. This thing is very, very thin and squishable. However, I'm trying to get rid of them and it's a good chance this is what you'll end up with if you j start off. What I tend to prefer is getting these plastic pour cups. Um, you can also get silicone mixing cups uh, for a lot of resin stuff and I do use those sometimes, but I've actually been rather liking using uh, 
like old yogurt container or old sour cream containers and whatnot as my mixing stuff. Granted, I'm usually mixing up a lot more resin at once for the epoxy. Um, but uh, the, the slightly harder plastics are nice because the resin will not bond with the plastic. It also generally won't bond with silicone, usually. Um, molds do not necessarily have an infinite life, but if you take better care of them, they can last longer. So I opened this up earlier to make sure that it would actually work. So for UV resin, the first thing you're going to do after you have your setup and you're wearing your goggles and blah, 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 um, is you're going to All right, I'm gonna pour some in there. And since red was the color we picked, I have this nice box of alcohol dyes and these actually. Um, actually, a different brand, I like this red better. Um, generally recommend shaking up your inks. It doesn't really matter if you shake up your powders. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm going to add one, uh, at most two drops to this amount, but probably just one drop if I can. There we go, one drop. Now this is an alcohol ink. It's uh, alcohol ink. It's from one of my favorite brands. I did not follow my own instructions and make sure that I had everything set up earlier. So I had to pull out my mixing stick with my gloves. Um, and now I'm going to mix it in. So one of the nice things about UV resins is you have essentially an arbitrary working time. Uh, because with an epoxy resin, some of them will d go really fast and it's like you only have a couple minutes, like some of the smooth on brand ones. It's like you mix it up and you better be ready to pour it in right then because it's going to be it's going to be hard and solid within like 20 minutes or something. Um, but for UV, uh, for some resin, most of the resins I've dealt with, they generally have a 20 to 40 minute working life. Working life means you can still pour things. It's still liquid. It's not become a solid gel, a, so a gel or a solid yet. UV resins, it will stay liquid until you harden it, um, which is great for a few things. It's great for complicated molds. It's great for um, trying to get the bubbles out, all of that kind of stuff. So now I have one little cup of red resin. Ah, I have a little, so part of my cheat sheet, I turned this on earlier, but I think it turned off. There it goes. This is a little, um, charcoal air filter uh, that I got for actually resin printing. Uh, but I like to use it when I'm doing my resin casting to make sure that I'm not being obnoxious to the people around me, re reduce fumes, all that kind of stuff. Um, I'm just going to set this in here to help raise my, uh, raise it off the ground, off the floor of this a little bit. Um, so whole bunch of these these are usually food containers at home they're great for holding uh, they're great for holding small things of dyes or colorants and all that kind of stuff but they're also great for I'm going to pour something in this and I want to put this in but I don't want to risk resin spilling everywhere and it's extra nifty right now because I can show you while I slowly pour stuff into it I could have also poured directly from the bottle if I wanted a clear fish or if I want to try and mix it in there but so I don't know how well people can see this. I had a camera that I was going to use, but preparation was apparently a little rushed. So I'm going slow, and I'm happy to do this again uh, if y'all are going to be at Control H after this. Um, so I'm trying to go in and make sure that I cover in all of the spots. Uh, some resins are doming resins. Some resins are, uh, and that means that when they cure, will have a dome over the top of it. Some of them are what's called self-leveling, and that means once uh, they harden, they'll, they're supposed to be smooth and flat, if you have enough. If you don't have enough, it's going to be concave. Um, so uh, this now has bubbles coming up to the top. I would toss it around, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Folks are perfectly welcome to come up and look, take a look at stuff if you like. Um, but So I have bubbles coming up from the top. There are two things to keep in mind here. One is, as I mentioned before, there could be bubbles trapped into different spots. Like for example, this fish, I know that there's a fin at the bottom of it, so there's sort of a valley. Um, so what you can do is take your toothpick and generally, gently try to pull the bubbles up. This is a, especially tends to happen if uh, you're making dice. Bubbles love to get stuck in the little crevices and edges of numbers and whatnot. 
So I have a torch here that I'm going to quickly uh, go over the, I tend to do it in bursts like this. You can actually hear me going because the resin will catch fire. Yes, you can set the liquid resin on fire. Um, <laughs> the other thing is that if you do it too much, if it gets too hot, uh, and this is true for both epoxy and UV resins, it will sort of cure a little bit at the top where you've been overheating it, and it'll form this skin that will mess with things. It'll prevent other bubbles from coming up, the surface might look different, all of that kind of thing. So for now, I'm just gonna hit it with the torch a bunch of times. Click, 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 click. And I'm gonna call that probably good enough. I meant to do this part at the beginning and then explain what I was doing afterwards, but. All right, so with UV, um, this is one of the things that drives me insane about like say UV nail dryers and stuff is protect your eyes. Um, on this, you may have noticed that it has a viewing window that has been uh, set up to be protected. So I'm going to move their very fancy podium. I should have just done this to begin with. Um, all right. So you will actually be able to see me turn on the light. Ooh, I turned on the light. Um. Morgan, how did you bring everything crashing down? <laughs> All right, is that on? Yes. yes, that on. Okay, so UV resins didn't cure very quickly. Because, uh, the darker it is, the longer it will take to cure. Uh, in this case, I'm gonna say, Set a timer for two minutes. All right, if you have not cured it enough, it may come out sticky. Um, some resins will, I've noticed some of the cheaper UV brands tend to come out a little sticky even if I leave them in there for a really long time. But the other thing is the, uh, the darker your, your thing is, you'll notice that that was still a fairly translucent red. The bottom of it, I'm done with the slides anyway. Um, the bottom of it, uh, may still be slightly sticky. So what I would do for this one is after the two minutes are up, I'm gonna give, I'm going to flip it and give it another 30 seconds since this is a clear mold to make sure that it comes through. I think Does I'm technically over time. Um, so if anyone has to go, I totally understand. But like I said at the beginning of this, this is one of my areas of interest. So I'm happy to keep babbling about this as long as y'all wanna keep sitting here. You're also welcome to come up and look at, my look at some of my other examples and whatnot as well. Morgan? Yes. Does curing uh, affect the color? Like, does it curing can color? affect the color. So one of the benefits of epoxy resins versus UV resins is epoxy resins tend to, tend to yellow less. Uh, UV resins tend to yellow more and all resin will start to yellow over time. Um, it's just one of the facts of resin. Uh, however, a lot, of the, a lot of the epoxy resins are specially formulated to yellow less or to be more UV resistant versus a UV resin, you can't really make that UV resistant for obvious reasons. <laughs> um, that said, I've found some brands tend to do it faster than others. You can protect them, uh, protect resins from yellowing over time in a few different ways. Uh, the biggest one is just keep it out of sunlight or keep it out of a lot of sunlight. Don't put it under a big UV lamp like this. Um, some, I found that some of the dyes tend to disappear when I uh, do the, when I use a UV. Uh, so it's like some of the pinks, usually pinks I've noticed, will sometimes fade and disappear. Um, in the example tray, that one of the example trays that was going around, ah, that's my timer. Um, there's a koi fish in one of those, you'll notice, where uh, that koi fish is orange now, uh, either orange or yellow. It was originally a bright red pink, and then I left it in a window, and over time it became that golden color instead. So yes, it can change it. All right, so example, our missing cup here. So since I put that in there to make sure it's very hot. So we have our fish. I'm going to set it back in for another 30 seconds. Keep in mind that it can possibly stick to whatever you're putting it on. I didn't say that so long, but I'd like to be talking to you. I'm done. I already told them to go freeze out. So I'm going to do another 30 seconds. And then I will be molding. So you don't need a whole lot to do you you don't need a whole lot to do resin. You especially don't need a whole lot.
volume or the UV of your your stand is pretty low. So UV tend, does tend to be more expensive than epoxy. Um, this I tend to get a lot of my stuff on Amazon just because it's cheaper. But like this kit was I think thirty dollars at Michaels. Uh, and keep in mind that. Thirty uh, dollars. If I had wanted the same quantity of UV, which actually it's harder to get large quantities of UV, it probably would have been close to double that price. Do you, do you buy it in enormous vats, or is that like you worry about spoilage if you're going to do that? You do have to worry about spoilage after a certain period of time. However, I've had bottles of resin that have, that I've lost interest for a while and didn't go back to it for like a year, and the same resin was not quite as good. It was a little more difficult to work with, but it still worked. But a new, newer resin has worked better for me. Um, and it will, supposedly it goes bad after time, and I have noticed when it's less good, but it will still work. Mm -hmm. um, I've heard that UV resin will actually cure itself after on its own after a while. I timer not go. Um, my timer did not go. Okay. I'm going to say that's probably wrong. <laughs> um, but in practice, it hasn't stopped me from using any resin I've had. Something like the size of this fish, uh, UV resin will probably be easier because you don't have to worry about mixing it. Don't, um, you have unlimited working time, all of that kind of stuff. But you will very quickly find yourself being limited. Okay, so you'll notice I basically just. Pop